get started with the first uh, controversies track. This is going to be minimalist barefoot versus traditional running shoes. Our first speaker is Nicholas Campitelli. He's from Copley, Ohio. Uh, Dr. Campitelli is a fellow of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine and also a fellow of the American Society of Podiatric Medicine. And he has no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. And the person debating him will be Jeffrey Ross, DPMMB from Houston, Texas. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine, the diplomat, American Board of Podiatric Surgery, or the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery, as they're now known, and a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. He's also a associate clinical professor at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, and he has no relevant conflicts to report. So let's get started with Dr. Kent Cuff. Thanks for coming. Thanks uh, to the APMA for inviting me to speak. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this controversial topic. It's very dear to my heart. So, without further ado, let's get started. I only have 15 minutes to get through this, and there's definitely not enough time to discuss it. So, from Akron, Ohio, I have no disclosures to report, although some of you may have heard that I've done work with Vibram. It was more of an educational setup. I was never paid by them or accepted any money from them. I'd love to tell you my story of how I became involved with this and involved in this aspect of running. It's more of a hobby for me with respect to running shoes and minimalist running, but it helped get me through a running injury that I had for almost 10 years. So we're going to just kind of move right into this. We're going to talk about three things today, shoes, form or biomechanics, and injury. Shoes do no more for the foot than a hat does for a brain. And I think that's the concept that I'm going to push or strive to have everyone understand today is that we, we focus so much in our society on shoes and, and our society has that stigma that I need support, I need a shoe with good support and, and it doesn't really exist and I want everyone to just try to absorb that today when you go home just to think outside of the box for a little bit that shoes aren't the answer up to everyone's problem. And where did this come from? Well it started back in the 70s in regards to running shoes with Nike when they started introducing a heel on their shoe. And nobody really knows why that was done. There are some theories on that. Some people thought it was because of um, trying to run fast, you needed a longer stride, you needed that heel for cushion. But there's something that came about called the running shoe theory. And that was just, if you haven't read this article and you're in this room today, I suggest you read it. It was published in 2014 in JATMA. And it discusses running shoes, minimalist shoes. It's a great review article. But the running shoe theory that came out discusses pronation control, elevated cushion heels. And it just kind of describes why the shoe was formed in that manner. And what's fascinating about this to me is people are, are calling me this self-proclaimed expert or you're, you're out preaching this new philosophy or theory, but it's actually not new. We've studied this and looked at this for many years. This is from 1987 where Robbins looked at running injuries being decreased by barefoot running, not so much because there's no shoe on, but because you're strengthening the foot. And the idea that the pronation control elevated heel was designed to prevent running injuries in a weak foot. And most of you, if not everyone in this room, has looked at your patients and said, hey, you need this foot type, or you have this foot type, you need this specific shoe for your foot type. Well, unfortunately, it's not evidence-based, and the literature shows that. So when the running shoes are being created, there's no scientific evidence behind what shoe we're creating for what foot type. And that's been looked at in, in the peer-reviewed literature. This is a study on 722 runners where they assigned shoes based on foot type and found no difference in running injuries. The Cochrane database, which is kind of the gold standard on looking at running injuries, 25 trials, 30,000 runners, and currently what we're doing is not working. We have seen not a decline in injury rates. This is irrelevant with regards to shoes, but our philosophy or our patterns for treating running injuries is not working. If you look at the shoe paradigm, they looked at 5,000 runners and fitting running shoes based on foot type, and again, found that there's no significant reduction in injuries when they're assigned based on foot type. So what about cushion, right? We can talk about shoes, but it's cushion. Food. I'm sure every one of you in here has told your patients, how, or asked your patients how many miles you have on your shoe, it's time to change, 300 to 500 miles, right? I love this slide because it's a 1989 Air Max versus the Hoka 1-1 that's out today. It's gone full circle, no change in injury rates. So there was one article published on the 250 to 500 mile retention in shoe absorption, and that's kind of last, that's from 1985. So we're basing that on old literature, and not to mention, we've seen a change in the um, 
what's being used in running shoes. So New Balance is even reporting that 1,000 miles can, can last on some of their shoes, but they're not putting that into running because people will be returning their shoes. If you look at cushion, foot control seems to improve as cushioning is lost. And you can say that cushioning, account, I'm sorry, foot control counts for at least a half of running related injuries. So you can't say that you need cushion to resolve injuries. Shoe cushioning capability, as the, as the shoe cushioning capability decreases, runners will modify their patterns of running to absorb shock. And these strategies in, in shoe degradation were unaffected by the cushioning technology. So the runners are changing their form based on their, their cushioning. Robbins again looked at in three different journals showed that perceived protection and comfort in running shoes will not will, will, will force the runners to not institute the innate shock absorbing behavior. So you're changing someone's gait or changing the way they absorb shock by putting a shoe between their foot and the ground. If we talk about proprioception, sorry. We, we focus so much on proprioception in diabetics, right? But when it comes to runners, we throw it all out the window and say, we're going to put this between your foot and the ground so that you no longer have proprioception to um, institute your shock absorption behaviors. What about trainers versus flats, right? You run 95% of your miles in, in trainers to get your body ready, and then you put racing flats on the run. There's no logic behind that. It's, back in athletic training, we focus on sport specific activity, and we never have runners. You wouldn't want someone to train the way they're not going to run. And even studies have looked at that and recommended tra gradually transitioning. When we talk about surfaces, the naysayers will say, well, our feet weren't designed to run on concrete. That's a topic for another discussion. But when you look at the surfaces that are out there, we have no evidence that running on hard surface causes any increase in impact forces or an increase in running injuries. And this is back from 86 all the way up to 2007. When you look at the surfaces, the, the, the capacity of pushing to reduce the impact forces is also being called into question with regards to the injury rates. And again, as I've been mentioning, proprioception is decreased by putting that heavy cushion on the shoes. When you look at asphalt, here's a study that showed that there's actually a decreased risk of Achilles tendon um, tendinopathy compared to running on sand, which it will increase the tendinopathy. So where is all this coming from? Why are we running in these types of shoes? Why are these shoes created? Where is this cushioning heel aspect coming from? What's well, actually interesting, because Vibram was sued for making false claims. But if you go back in history and look at, at, at the literature, not the literature, I'm sorry, the, the ads for shoes, the industry sets the standard. It's not peer reviewed. It's not scientifically based. The shoes get sold. The runners wear them. They tell their friends. They sell more. The shoe companies sell more. And that's how it starts. It, it, there, there's no medical-based evidence on why running shoes are being made, created, or used. And I have some theories on that and we can talk about it later. Unfortunately, I don't have the time. But let's talk about biomechanics. When I got involved with this about five or six years ago, I had to bring Root into this, right? Because if not, many would bring up Root in the, uh, in the topic of debate. But Root actually said that abnormal pronation during stance phase does not produce major symptomatology. So if you have your runners take their shoes off and you look at their foot type, you can't base your decision of shoes because you can't really say that that abnormal pronation or ecstatic stance is making a difference. And he even went on to say that during locomotion, rarely does abnormal pronation even produce enough symptomatology that would cause an injury. So what is actually pathologic? These are three foot types from a study that we just submitted. And basically, what we're saying is that there are variances to foot types. And in all three of these, are they truly symptomatic or pathologic or are they just variances? One thing that we did say that is pathologic is ankle aquinas, and I'm sure all of us in this room would agree that ankle aquinas, which is a decrease of dorsiflexion of less than 10 degrees, could be pathologic, right? The subtalar joint will increase the amount of motion as a result of plantar flexing and uncovering the tailor head. Well, what happens when you put your foot into a A6 gel chyona that has anywhere from a 13 millimeter, 14 millimeter drop, right? You introduce ankle aquinas. You see an x-ray of the foot without the heel comparing it to an x-ray of a foot with a running shoe with an elevated heel. You can clearly see the ankle aquinas that's created. We know that since the introduction of a pronation control elevated cushioned heel, there's actually been an increase, not a decrease, in Achilles tendon injuries. We also know that heel elevation during stance places the ankle joint in a position where proprioception is inherently poor. This is from 2001 and the capacity of existing levels of heel elevation to increase pronation has also been noted as demonstrated in 1993. The overall impact on injury rates of running an issue with an elevated heel remains untested in clinical trials. I'm sorry, running rates in a running shoe with an elevated cushion heel remains untested in clinical trials. Some that I was supposed to be debating today actually published something in 2014 that shows there's actually an increase 
in Achilles tendon tensile loads when you introduce a 10 millimeter heel with regards to running. We can say that wearing a shoe inhibits normal foot range of motion with respect to the forefoot to rear foot. Barefoot um, running or, or just functioning has the ability to increase uh, joint position with regards to the force that's on the foot and overuse injuries. This is one of my favorite slides from this, this, show, this um, lecture. This is a soccer shoe. And look how flexible it is. And what's, it's, this is anecdotal, but when you look at the injury rates in soccer players, they're not that high, right? And how many miles, this is um, from stats.com, seven to nine miles per game soccer players are running and they're in a minimalist shoe. Now you could say, that, that, well, there's a, it's a different surface, it's softer, it's cushioned, but that doesn't take into regards pronation. You, you can't say that they're not excessively pronating in a minimalist shoe. And let's look at the pronation articles. I have to go a little faster, we're running out of time, but there's, there's been no consistent association with pronation and injury rates. If you look at medial and lateral brown reactive forces, with regards to whether there's an increase in pronation or decrease in pronation, we don't see any change or significant change in the ground reactive forces in regards to the amount of pronation. The hypothesis that anterior knee pain is related to foot pronation has not been proven. Patellofemoral pain has not been proven with increased pronation. We conclude that the lower extremity alignment is not a major risk factor for running injuries in a study on over 304 runners over 12 months. Another study looked at 927 runners in 2014 and found that there was a, that the widespread relief of pronation does not show an increased rate of injury. Oh, um, okay. Another study, based on the review of literature, there's no definite link between atypical foot mechanics and running shoe injuries, or running injury mechanisms, right? So does pronation actually cause injury? We don't know. I mean, it, my philosophy is that it's the innate shock absorbing capacity of our foot, right? It's a mobile adapter, we'll all agree on that. So when you put a rigid piece of plastic in your shoe, it's no longer a mobile adapter. It cannot fill the ground, it cannot utilize the proprioception to adapt to the ground. Let's talk about strike patterns. This is a very hot topic that um, is being discussed amongst the running industry. Forefoot versus heel. Kevin Kirby utilized this recently in Podiatry Today to for, for lack of better terminology, to blast me in regards to forefoot striking. And he, and he used this study that said 72% of these Kenyans were heel strikers. But this, this is what's fascinating. When you look at peer-reviewed literature, when you look at studies, you actually have to read them and find out what they're looking at. They looked at 19 subjects who ran 49 feet, and they looked at strike patterns in 49 feet. Well, that's 0.29% of a 5K and 0.04% of a marathon. I heel strike during a marathon, and I, don't even, and I think that heel striking is bad. So you can't base it on that distance that they were running. It was also done on a habitually barefoot population from northern Canada. It doesn't run much, and they live in a very sandy habitat. And they also showed that there was an increase in force in regards to heel impact on heel striking. Lieberman from Harvard did a study in 2012 that looked at 54, I'm sorry, 53 collegiate athletes and showed that there's actually a higher rate of injury in regards to heel striking. Here's a study that had more runners than the, than the one that I had mentioned from Dr. Kirby, 46% more, and they showed that the majority of these Tara Ameras, who are, are, are habitual barefoot, are actually midfoot and forefoot striking. And this brings into topic the spring theory that Ruth never discussed and isn't really focused much on in podiatry or biomechanics. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the spring theory, but basically what's happening is we've got three joints in our lower extremity, right? We have our hip joint, our knee joint, and our ankle joint. If your forefoot striking or midfoot striking, or the foot is below the center of gravity, even if the heel somewhat strikes, you need to engage the spring mechanism. If you heel strike, you've thrown out one third of your shock absorbing capability because the heel is hitting the ground, not utilizing your Achilles tendon and your gastrocnemius to absorb shock, right? It's simple physics. So why would you heel strike? Why would you eliminate one third of that spring mechanism? There's just no logic behind it. And what's even more fascinating is when we take a limb off of someone and put a prosthetic on them, what are they doing? They're midfoot striking, right? There's no heel or you don't eliminate that one third of the spring mechanism, we keep it. So let's talk about injury, right? All the naysayers will say that there's an increase in injury rate when you're in minimalist shoes. Well, if you look at the injury rates over the last 40 years, they've actually stayed the same. So what we're doing isn't working and you can even say that the injury rates have increased over the last 40 years. I'm going to pick one to talk about, and that's stress fractures. This study came out looking at Vibram and Five Fingers saying that there was an increase in stress fracture rates in those running barefoot. Well, guess what? Anybody that has any understanding of Wolf's Law in, in bones reaction, uh, did I state the right law? 
<laughs> Wolf's Law, you're going to increase bone in regards to stress. These two runners did nothing more than change their shoes. Of course they're going to get a stress fracture. You need to gradually transition. Both of them got your stress fractures because they did nothing to their training patterns other than change the shoe. So their foot wasn't ready for it. What about plantar fasciitis? In our practice, we've eliminated orthotics and uh, structure pushing running shoes back for our practice because we're strengthening the foot to reduce plantar fasciitis. And I think this is the, the, what we're going to see come out of a lot of studies. We're going to see less support for chronic cases because as you strengthen the foot, you start to alleviate the abnormal stress. But this particular study looked at the plantar fascia when it was sectioned and found that there's no inflammatory cells. So is it truly the plantar fascia that's inflamed or is it the abductor hallucis? the flexor lucis brevis and you know, the other muscles that insert the same area. We, we find that when we convert people to this particular pattern of barefoot or minimalist running, they strengthen, strengthen the abductor lucis, and that's what Lieberman recently showed. This is a study that we just did that was um, is being submitted, and we transitioned 12 people. We had 48 total runners, and we showed that there's an increase in girth of the abductor hallucis by transitioning to a minimalist shoe. It's not the shoe, it's the pattern of your running that's changing, that's causing the strength gains in the muscle. So in summary, how one runs is probably more important than what's on one's foot, but what's on one's foot may affect how someone runs. And that's what I want to stress to everybody. When you, when you look at the American College of Sports Medicine, they just released this guideline on, on picking shoes. One of the big qualities to avoid is they even say avoid a thick, high cushion heel. Biomechanics, does pronation really make a difference or is it there for shock absorption? We discussed injury rates, do minimal issues increase injury? Time's up. But I was at the end of my slide, thank you. That's my son who did his first 5K. He ran it in a pair of socks. My wife almost killed me. <laughs> but he wasn't supposed to run, so he didn't bring his running shoes and he had Crocs on. So he started running and they kept falling off, so I took them from him and he finished in his socks, which was dear to my heart, but my wife thought I'd 